Um, really quick, we're gonna talk about the presidential nomination process. Okay, so when we start talking presidential nomination, we were simply talking about the process in which, and it's kind of a complex process, we're gonna condense it a little bit, but nomination simply means how political parties, in our case, Democrat and Republican, right, are um, two-party system in the United States, basically how candidates go about seeking a party's nomination for president. Nomination simply means that they are endorsed by a party, um, and that party is going to put that person on a ballot as their candidate for president slash vice president, and that's what nomination is, okay? So this, this process is kind of complex, but again, like I said, we're going to try to condense it here as much as we can. Um, so generally what happens is states, most U.S. states are going to hold one of two types of primary elections, okay? A primary election, so in this case, a, a true primary, kind of like what North Dakota does, we use this system, is statewide there's going to be a vote, and this just happened very recently in the state with the Democrat Party. And statewide there's going to be a vote. Uh, people are going to go out and they're going to cast a vote for a candidate of a certain party, right? So on that uh, primary ballot, there's probably only going to be a couple positions like president. You know, in some years there might be other statewide offices, but for president, what's going to happen is there's going to be a list of names, Democrats and Republicans. And the rule with a primary ballot is if you vote for, say, one Democrat, for any other office on that ballot, you also have to vote Democrat. Okay, now when you go and you vote for president in November, you can vote for Democrats, Republicans, you know, whoever you want. But for on a primary election ballot, you can only vote for candidates of one party because what the party is trying to do is they're essentially trying to determine whose name they want to put on the ballot come election time, okay? And that's a primary election. A caucus works very similar to that, except a caucus is a little bit more closed where only party members get to vote. So now like in North Dakota, we don't have voter registration. We're the only state that does not use voter registration. So this is a little, you know, why we use a primary partially. But in a state like Iowa, they use a caucus. And so what'll happen is when Iowa holds their caucus, which again, they're usually the first state to do so come um, campaign season, or election season, excuse me, what they will do is they'll have members from, you know, each party show up and only those party members vote, okay? And what they're trying to do is determine whose name they're going to put on the ballot, right? So that's kind of what happened here this past March um, in a state like Iowa where they held their Democrat caucus. Members of the Iowa Democrat Party, they showed up. They voted on which candidate they would like for their name to appear on the ballot. Um, and the rest is kind of history there, but that's the way a caucus works. So very similar to a primary. So primaries and caucuses, what I would know about them is they're essentially, they are used to provide some guidance to the political parties as far as whose name should be put on the ballot come election season. Okay. So once all the primaries and caucuses have taken place, so this will be happening. I know that this has been delayed a little bit, um, given our, our current pandemic and the state of affairs in the United States. But um, what's going to happen is very soon here, sometime this summer, I think the Democrats announced that there's their national convention has been moved to August, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But at some point in time, what's going to happen is the Democrat Party, um, we'll talk Republicans here in a second, but the Democrat Party in this case, because Donald Trump, President Trump is a Republican, he is more than likely, like he is a shoe in to be nominated to run for the Republican um, or to receive the Republican endorsement for president again, okay? Because parties can only endorse one candidate for president. So what's gonna happen is it's it's appearing more and more like what's gonna happen here this coming summer slash fall is that the Democrat party is at their national convention is they are gonna more than likely, again, from the looks of it here in, in mid-April, is they're gonna nominate Joe Biden. Okay, and they're going to nominate Joe Biden and his vice presidential candidate. And that all happens at the national convention. So until that national convention takes place, um, until that national convention takes place, there is no formal nomination. The formal nomination occurs at the national convention. So it's at this national convention where the delegates and the superdelegates will kind of cast their votes based on state primaries. 
um, because delegates from each state will come to this national convention and they're going to cast their votes based on primary and caucus results. Okay. Now, before the national convention takes place, usually, um, most of the time, the outcome is kind of already a known thing based on these primary and caucus results. So it's usually, there's not usually a whole lot of surprises there, but in the past, there has been. Okay, the other thing that happens here too is that um, this is also going to be at the same time when the political party starts talking about their platform. And we get into political parties, we'll talk more about platforms and such. But essentially, what a, po a political party's platform is are the things they want to do. So, for example, right now, some of the things that the Republican Party platform were centered on in 2016, the last time we had a presidential election, was immigration reform. Um, and combating terror, right? So those are some of the things that were a big part of the Republican Party platform when President Trump started his um, his first term, you know, nearly four years ago. So the platform essentially just refers to what a political party wants to accomplish. Um, at that national convention, candidates get endorsed. We then hold our presidential election in November, go back to our electoral college, and we determine a winner in January, okay? Um, so once the president gets elected, right? So we'll just use President Trump as our example right now because he is our current president. And presidents have a whole variety of powers. I would understand, though, is that presidents are not all, all powerful, right? Checks and balances, right? Presidents can only do so many things. Can they influence other branches of the government? Totally, right? They have the ability to appoint judges and to call in and end sessions of Congress and to appoint a whole variety of other positions but they are not all powerful, okay? So when we start talking about the powers of the president, we kind of break them down. And the powers we're gonna talk about today are just simply called the executive powers. Um, and again, the idea of the president, the main role of our executive is to carry out laws regardless of their personal views. Now, does that always happen? You know, right? The executive branch, they carry out the law, right? Congress cannot enforce their own law. The judicial branch cannot enforce laws. It's up to the executive, right? So there has been um, conflicts in history where our executive branch or our president have maybe not have chosen not to uh, enforce laws in the way that they were supposed to be intended. Okay, but one of these examples of executive power is the ordinance power. And the ordinance power is the president's ability to issue executive orders. So an executive order is essentially a law, except, or it has the same effect as a law, I should say. Um, but it's not a law because it doesn't get passed by Congress. An executive order is more of like a directive that has a similar effect as a law. So for example, going way back to World War II, FDR issued an executive order um, to have all Japanese Americans living on the West Coast to have them interned in war camps in the central part of the United States because it was a military threat, right? That's an example. Um, other present examples, Right now, you see a lot of state governors because they're the state executives. So like Governor Burgum, in our case, issuing executive orders, you know, to close non-essential businesses. OK, it's not a law because it doesn't get passed by the legislature, but it has the same effect as a law because it's an executive order. Um, another one that we could talk about that was maybe a little more controversial as well as well was what was known as President Trump's quote unquote travel ban where the United States said, you know, people from these countries aren't welcome to travel, to, you know, from their country into the United States. That was an executive order, not a law, but it had the similar effect as a law. So ordinance power, you simply refers to the president's ability to issue these executive orders. We then also talk about the appointment or removal power. Okay. So the president, it's in the constitution. The president has all kinds of power to appoint various government positions, cabinet members, all their secretaries, their, you know, their media advisor, all these, all these different positions, right? There's a lot. Um, all federal judges are appointed by the president, ambassadors, the list goes on and on. Um, in most cases, um, with cabinet members, judges, ambassadors, um, yes, the president has the power to appoint them, but they have to be confirmed by the Senate. Okay. So the president can say, yeah, you know, I want to, I appoint you to be the new secretary of state, right? President Trump has had a couple of those. I appoint you to be the new Secretary of State. They then have to go before the United States Senate, and the United States Senate's going to question them about it. Okay, and that's kind of where politics becomes kind of a tricky thing, right? President Trump has appointed all kinds of federal judges. He's appointed two Supreme Court justices. Um, 
and Neil Grosich and Brett Kavanaugh. Again, in both cases, they had to go before the Senate. The Senate had to confirm them. Same thing with all of the secretaries, um, Secretary of Education and the Secretaries of State. The president has the power to appoint. They have to be confirmed by the Senate. That's in the Constitution. Um, and now again, how is how is it chosen? Who's going to be appointed? It's kind of a complicated thing. Um, and it's a variety of things. Um, and especially when it comes to like federal judges, that's a very complicated matter because ju the judicial branch is supposed to be the one branch of government that's insulated from politics. But now again, what happens, and judges will never come out and say, I'm Democrat, I'm Republican, et cetera, et cetera. But do you think a conservative president like a President Trump, is he going to uh, appoint a liberal judge? Probably not. He's going to try to appoint a judge that has a similar interpretation of the Constitution or a similar stance on issues as he does. Um, but again, none of these judges get voted on. They're all appointed, right? So um, they're supposed to be insulated from politics in that regard. And so again, how these names are come up with or, or who gets chosen, it's kind of a... It's kind of a, a wild thing, but it's mostly influenced by political parties, um, maybe past relationships or relationships the president has with some of these other people. Um, you know, what major donors want, you know, who donate to campaigns and such. So it's kind of a mess, but there is a lot of influence. It's not as simple as just saying, yep, that person. No, there's usually a lot of debate on who a president's going to appoint for a certain position. Okay, now with that too, um, we say the president does have the power to appoint. That is in the Constitution. Removal power is kind of controversial. Um, presidents have removed people from office. Um, I should say, excuse me, let me back up. Presidents have removed appointed individuals from office before. Um, but, um, but there's some controversy with that. Because the question becomes is, does the president have the power to do that? Um, and now what happens in most cases is like uh, cabinet members from one administration to the next. Usually a, a pre each new president is going to bring in an entirely new cabinet. I'm talking Secretary of State, Treasury, you know, Agriculture, Homeland Security, all the different executive departments that we'll talk more about later. But the controversy becomes is can the president just say, I don't like you anymore, I want to remove you. And, you know, some say yes, some say no. The Supreme Court's kind of been all over on the board on it, depending on the circumstances. Well, that's something else where usually what will happen is if you see some conflict like that, usually that person will resign their position. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then our third and final executive power here is what we call executive privilege. And this is what presidents believe their power is to be is to withhold information from Congress, specifically Congress, because then Congress has the oversight function where they can investigate <clears throat> and, you know, call the president and ask some questions, that kind of thing. But executive privilege <clears throat> is basically the president's power to quote unquote withhold information or not tell everything to Congress, usually on issues of like national security or classified information, things like that. And one of the big examples of this of when you see a limitation on executive privilege goes back to the 1970s and President Nixon, right? So many of us remember President Nixon as um, resigning from office amidst the Watergate scandal where you know, there was a break in at the Democratic Party national headquarters. There was all these different things that came out. President, you know, Nixon, you know, appeared to be involved, maybe even orchestrated it. There was recording conversations. And eventually what happens is these recorded conversations having to do with the break in and such. The U.S. Supreme Court says you have to hand over the tapes because Congress was investigating them. Um, and you have to hand over the tapes to Congress. And Nixon says, no, I don't. Executive privilege, right? Cites that, says, I have executive privilege. I don't have to share the tapes, right? That's a highly sensitive material. As a president, I cite my executive privilege to not share those tapes. Well, Supreme Court goes after him. There's a big Supreme Court case. And the Supreme Court says, actually, President Nixon, because there is not a, there's a, because there is a national security interest here with, uh, um, with these tapes and such and a national interest as whether the president's involved or not, you do have to hand over their tapes and there is a limitation on your executive privilege. Okay. And so that's the United States versus Nixon Supreme court case, but just really quick on some of our different executive powers and our nomination process. Let me know if you have questions.